Hi guys, this is Majid from Mid Student Help. First, let me apologize for this long that we didn't upload any video. We have been going through a lot of time restriction. So from now till the end of the semester, well, I think I'm going to be able to do two to three more videos, depending on like how much time will I have. So just keep uh, tuned on our Facebook page and we're going to be like uploading all the news there. So in today's video, we're going to be covering the anticoagulants and antiplatelet drugs. First, you should know that bleeding is a very serious issue to our bodies. And that's why our bodies have two different pathways or two different mechanisms in which they are going to fight bleeding and they try to stop the bleeding. Now, the whole mechanism of trying to stop the bleeding is the so-called the hemostasis. So the hemostasis is when our body is trying to stop bleeding from an injured uh, blood vessel. All right. Now, hemostasis, on the other hand, is different from thrombosis, since the thrombosis is the formation of a, a, a clot inside our vessels, but without any damage to the vessel, which means that there was no reason for the coagulation in the first place. So the thrombosis is always pathological. Okay. Now, from pathology, you should already know what is the difference between the venous thrombus and the arterial thrombus. Let's not get into that now. Okay. So let's imagine that we had a normal blood vessel like right here. This is a normal blood vessel and these are the endothelia. So in the normal case, the endothelia would be releasing the nitric oxide and prostaglandins. Now the nitric oxide is going to do vasodilation. So if we keep the vessels dilated, this is going to decrease the chance that a coagulation is going to happen or a platelet aggregation is going to happen, right? That's how we try to defend our bodies from any pathological coagulation and aggregation of the platelets by vasodilating the vessels. So the healthy intact endothelia would be releasing the nitric oxide in order to keep it vasodilated. On the other hand, producing the prostaglandins is going to be inhibiting the platelet from aggregation. So we protect our vascular system from producing thrombus or uh, forming thrombus by inhibiting the platelet aggregation by producing prostaglandins from the intact endothelia. Okay, now let's see what happens when there is a vascular damage. There is a damage here to the endothelia. So this is the blood vessel here. And here there is a damage to the endothelia. So, first of all, what you should know is that whenever the endothelia is injured, there is no longer production of the nitric oxide or the prostaglandin in this area. So, in the area surrounding the injury only, there is going to be no more production of the nitric oxide or the prostaglandin, hence the injury. Okay, so if there is no nitric oxide, this means that there is no vasodilation which results in vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction is always bad because the more uh, vasoconstricted the vessel is, the more turbulence can happen and there is a higher chance that a coagulation can happen or a platelet aggregation can happen, right? So this is causing, a, um, uh, causing like a risk to form a coagulation. And if there is no prostaglandin, this means that the platelets now can coagulate. And that's what's going to happen. So what is going to happen at the site of injury is a platelet aggregation, right? Why is that? Why did the platelet aggregate at the site of the injury? First, because there is no prostaglandin. And second, because the injured endothelia will represent a receptor on their surface, which is the so-called the von Willebrand factor, the VWF, the, uh, the von Willebrand factor. So this factor that is going to be represented on the surface of the endothelia is going to attract the platelets to attach to this receptor. So when they attach here, 
they are gonna form some sort of a platelet uh, plug on the site of injury. Now, when they attach here, they are gonna sense that there is a problem. So they are gonna release factors. We're talking now about the platelets that have aggregated at the site of the injury. They are producing factors. What factors? First, the thrombosine A2, the prothrombin, the ADP, serotonin, and the platelet activating factors. Now, what is the main function or what is the main purpose of producing all of these factors from these aggregated platelets? So, when the platelets have aggregated here, they need more help. They need to call more platelets to come into the site of injury to aggregate here. And that's how they do it. They produce factors in order to attract more platelets. And when the platelets are going to arrive to the site of injury, they are going to get activated. Now, what does activation of, a th uh, of a thrombocytes or platelets mean? Activation of, a thromb uh, of a thrombocytes means the expression of a receptor called GP2A3B. So the glycoprotein 2A3B. Now, whenever the platelet that is activated gonna act, uh, gonna represent this receptor, the GP2A3B, this means that the fibrinogen that is circulating in the blood is gonna start forming bridges. So it is gonna start to connect the platelets through this GP2A3B. And now, when the platelets are all connected to each other, you can see now that they are capable of forming a bigger platelet block at the site of the injury. Okay? Now, this platelet block or mash is going to try its best to stop the bleeding at the site of injury, but in most of the cases, it is not going to be enough. Okay? So, till now, we didn't say a word about the coagulation and the coagulation factors. All what we have been talking about is the platelets, right? Okay, so we said that the endothelia got injured. It represented the von Willebrand factor. The platelets aggregated because of the absence of the prostaglandins and the representation of the von Willebrand factor. And when they got aggregated, they released factors and these factors attracted more platelets to the site of injury, and these platelets got activated due to the platelet activating factor, and this has led to the expression of the glycoprotein 2A3B, and then fibrinogen linking or fibrinogen bridges have formed between the platelets to help them form a platelet block at the site of injury. Okay, so if this is not enough, or if there was a more severe injury to the blood vessel, the, the collagen fibers can be exposed to the circulation, right? So if the, for example, this was the collagen, if the collagen fibers got exposed to the circulation, this is going to lead to the activation of the so-called the intrinsic, the intrinsic pathway of the coagulation. So how did the intrinsic pathway got activated? By being exposed to the collagen due to the vascular injury. Now, when it's activated, the first factor that is gonna get activated is factor number 12. Activated factor number 12 is gonna activate factor number, uh, number 11. Activated factor number 11 is gonna activate factor number nine. And then factor number nine, with the help of other factors, is gonna activate factor number 10. Okay, let's just stop here. Now, what about the extrinsic pathway? How does it get activated? The extrinsic pathway gets activated if there was an injury even to the surrounding tissues of the vessel. If there was an injury to, to this tissue that is surrounding the, uh, the blood vessel, they are gonna release a factor called TF, the tissue factor. So the tissue factor is going to activate factor number 7, and factor number 7, the activated form, is going to also activate factor number 10. So here, the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway, they become one, they overlap. Okay? Now, 
why is it called intrinsic I, and why is it called extrinsic? Of course, from the name, you can tell that intrinsic means that it is inside because all of the factors that are used in the intrinsic pathway, they are all present in the blood. They were already in the serum, right? But in the extrinsic pathway, not all of them. Why? Because the tissue factor came from the tissues that were surrounding the blood vessel not from inside the blood and the serum, right? That's why it's called extrinsic. Anyway, so the activated factor number 10 is going to activate the prothrombin to thrombin, and then the thrombin is going to activate the fibrinogen to the fibrin, or it's going to cleave the fibrinogen to the fibrin, and then we're going to have a nice fibrin mash or fibrin clot that is going to stop the bleeding. Okay, this is the coagulation pathway in a brief explanation. Now, in some steps, you see that there is a green star, like in the activation of factor 10 or the, uh, or the formation of the thrombin. This star means that we need calcium and phosphate here. So this is not possible if we don't have calcium. If you have watched my first video about the calcium channel blockers, it was something very important that I mentioned at the very beginning of the video, and I said that the calcium is really important in coagulation, right? And that's because without calcium, even if we have an activated factor number 9 or number 7, they are not going to be able to activate factor number 10. We always need calcium for that. Okay, so let's see what stops this coagulation cascade from happening if we had no injury so right now you're watching the video you don't have any vascular injury hopefully so how is this system not working what is stopping the system or coagulation cascade from working we have three endogenous re uh, regulation sorry i can't move this okay so the endogenous regulations are three things. The first one is the so-called the endogenous heparin. Now, the endogenous heparin, so we have heparin produced in our bodies. Maybe you can recall the mast cells, for example. They have a lot of heparin. Now, this heparin is going to activate a factor called antithrombin 3. Now, from the name antithrombin, it is going to stop the coagulation cascade here. It's going to block the thrombin action on the fibrinogen. This is the first way that our body is fighting against unnecessary activation of the co coagulation cascade, the heparin. The second one is the so-called the thrombomodulin. Now, the thrombomodulin is some sort of, let's say, like a receptor that is expressed on the intact endothelia. Okay. Now, this receptor is going to try to grab every thrombin um, every thrombin that is circulating in the blood and hold it in place because we don't need it. We don't need the thrombin to cause fibrinogen conversion to fibrin in the intact area. So, for example, we said that the, here there was a local injury, right? Now, do we need a thrombin at this part of the vessel? No, because all of this part, all the endothelia are intact. They don't need coagulation. And of course, because the blood is circulating in this way, some of the thrombin that has been formed here is going to reach here, right? Some thrombin is going to reach here, where actually it is surrounded by intact endothelia. We don't need this, in, uh, this thrombin. So the, the intact endothelia is going to represent a receptor called the thrombomodulin that is going to grab this thrombin and inhibit its function, okay? Now, the third one is the so-called the tissue plasminogen activator. Now, tissue plasminogen activator, it activates plasminogen. What is going to be formed there? The, plas the activated plasminogen is going to dissolve this fibrin. So if we had already a, a blood clot or a coagulation, we can break it down, we can break this fibrin uh, mesh, uh, this fibrin clot or whatever, a plug, uh, by the plasminogen, okay? So the plasminogen is going to go there and dissolve this fibrin down. 
All right, so these are the three endogenous regulations by which we stop our coagulation cascade from happening when we don't need it. The endogenous heparin, the thrombomodulin, as well as the tissue plasminogen activator. Now, one more important thing. In, in some cases, we're going to have a problem with the coagulation cascade. This problem can be genetic or can be acquired. Now, how can it be genetic? You have, of course, heard of hemophilia, right? So hemophilia A is basically the absence of factor 8. Or hemophilia B is the absence of factor 9. Hemophilia C is absence of factor number 11. Always, if we have any of these factors that are needed in the coagulation missing, this means that we're going to have a problem with, the, with the stopping the bleeding. The, the patient may bleed to death if he doesn't get help right now so this is a genetic problem with the coagulation cascade what about the acquired problems with the coagulation cascade the acquired is basically if the factory that is responsible for producing these factors was defective it had a problem what is the factory of these of these guys the factory is the liver right so in a liver disease the patient might have a problem with coagulation of Sorry. <laughs> so, um, in a liver disease, they can have a problem with coagulation. Also, uh, in case of vitamin K deficiency. So, I haven't mentioned that yet, but if the patient had a vitamin K deficiency, this means that he's going to have a problem with the producing factor number 2, 7, 9 and 10. Okay, so these four factors, they are dependent on the presence of uh, vitamin K. Now, if the patient was vitamin K deficient, in some cases we can give them what a select uh, a synthetic form of vitamin K. You need to know the name of the synthetic form of vitamin K. It is the so-called the minadiol sodium phosphate. Minadiol sodium phosphate is the synthetic vitamin K. Okay, that's it for now and let's move to the drugs.